Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Patrick Byrne. So next, we have another incredible entrepreneur to speak with you. She is a fixture at Fee Seminars. I'm really excited to introduce her to you. Magat Wade is our next speaker. She is passionate about entrepreneurship and creating high-end retail brands based on diverse African traditions that change the perception of Africa. So she's the founder and CEO of Toswan, Tiosan, a high-end skincare products line, and she's been named as one of the top 20 youngest power women in Africa, Magat Wade. Good morning, guys. And thanks for having me. It's always an honor to come here, talk to you, um, see so many of my friends. You know, when I come here, you should ask my husband, Michael. He's like, why are you so excited? I'm like, oh, you don't understand. I'm going to be seeing my people. So uh, thanks for being those people. <laughs> right. So um, when it comes to addressing the global poor, I think we can talk about three categories of people, because at the end of the day, you have to understand, but I think my only reason of being alive on this earth, I have decided by now, is that I want to contribute everything that I have to making sure that we make poverty truly history. I'm not trying to steal the words from Bono, but I really mean it when I say poverty needs to be history by now. It's 2017. You know, really? Do we still have to talk about this? So, but when it comes to dealing with um, global poverty, let's talk about three categories of people. First are the anti-capitalist. Two are the technocrats. And three are the people out there who are willing to advocate for capitalism. And on there, I see a lot. I see mainly the libertarians leading the charge. So thank you for what you do. Of those, Of those anti-capitalists, you know, those do-gooders, they so care about me, the poor African person, you know? Oh, we care about women's rights, and we care about the poor's rights, and yeah, but we only care about them as long as we can be anti-capitalist in the process. As long as we get to trash capitalism, yeah, I care about the global poor. So, but unfortunately for them, it's been proven that actually one of the best remedies to poverty is, you know it, capitalism, right? Since, since that was made clear, I would not even sit here and try to tell you how many of them we lost in the process. No longer interested. Oh, well, poverty, well, yeah, yeah, well, we have other issues now. What type of people will sit here and tell me that they care about the poor yet only if it means that they get to trash capitalism. So I've written them off. Of um, the technocrats, technocrats are a little bit better than the anti-capitalist. But to my taste, they're a little bit too soft and a little bit too ambiguous when they're not just flat out misguided. Why do I say that? I get called to talk to so many different groups all over the world. Some groups are the anti-capitalist, and yeah, I go there and I give it to them as well. But you know what? They never dare, ever dare, to counter me on what I say to them about capitalism when I'm there. Maybe the messenger matters. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but the technocrats. So I happen to be giving lectures at uh, Berkeley. You know UC Berkeley? You know the Mecca? Hmm? So there, usually I'm called to go talk to graduate students. And these are the people who are, who are supposed to later go and be the practitioners of, for example, the Millennium Development Goals of the UN. You know those 17 goals that they have decided at the UN that, you know, oh, if we do this, this entrepreneurial thing, all these issues are going to go away. So I have these people, you know, graduate students. They're, God bless their hearts. Have good, good hearts. And then, I remember the first time I did it, 
They were just coming back from their big powwow meeting in New York with Jeffrey Sachs, their celebrity economist in chief. You know, big powwow, yeah, we're gonna fix you know, poverty and all, the issue, all of this stuff. And I asked them, I said, mostly who was there out of, uh, I think, of close to 1,500 people? They remembered the people, various ministers, government people from various countries. They remembered many professors. They remembered many people from the NGO community. And when I asked, did you see anybody from the private sector? They actually had to stop for a moment and try to think. And somebody said, oh, well, maybe a couple people. Mind you, this is a group that's meeting to talk about how we're going to make sure that everybody gets access to clean water. How are we going to make sure that everybody gets access to some type of health care you know, when they need it? Or reduce the level of maternal and um, you know, babies dying when women are giving birth? How are we going to make sure that everybody gets fed properly? Well, it was very interesting because I took each one of the 17 goals on the screen and I asked them, who do you think doesn't have access to clean water? Someone who is too poor to have access to clean water. You know, it is true that in some parts of Africa, in some parts of uh, the rest of the developing world, yeah, there is uh, issues around access to clean water. But let me tell you, the people who can afford it always find clean water. They actually drink better water than you guys here. So it's, not a, ma it's a matter of poverty. Who does not have access to proper nutrition? Who is malnourished? Someone who's too poor to buy enough nutritious foods. And we walked through each one of the goals, and I made the case for them as to each one of those goals was directly, most of the time, related to poverty. And even when it was not directly related to poverty, it was one of the consequences of poverty. And they were just like, well, I guess that's true. So if, yes, indeed, poverty seems to be at the root of all of these problems, and I will, yes, even dare go to say that poverty is at the root of a lot of conflicts in this world. Well, what does it mean? People are poor, why? Why are you poor? How does it work that you're poor? You're poor because you don't have enough money. It's that simple. You're poor when you don't have enough money to take care of your basic needs. Where does money come from for most of us? It comes from a source of income, right? Where does the source of income for, come, for, come from for most of us? A job. job. Anyone else? Job and or? Thank you. Or you know you're investing, but before you invest, you got to have that money from somewhere. But even there, when I asked that question at my uh, you know Berkeley graduates, they're like some of them are like, yeah, I come from government. For those people here who think that jobs come from government, yes, it is true that the government hires some people. But even if you work for the government, I would like to think that you're being paid, right? Now, where does that money come from? We go back to, exactly, it comes from taxes, that people who work, employees, people who hire them, you know, the companies and the employers, pay so that we, in turn, you know, pay these government people. So even there, we're back to commerce. Even there, we're back to business. And so once we make that clear, and my UC Berkeley graduate, we all agreed to that, because I always like to take checkpoints, then I say, okay, if indeed huh, jobs is the solution to this massive, massive problem we have out there of poverty, then don't you think that maybe we should try to think about where jobs come from? And we said entrepreneurs. So if it comes from entrepreneurs, and business, then don't you think that we should really try and pay attention to what type of environment those businesses get to operate in? Don't you think? Yeah. Right? <laughs> okay, so when those guys tell me, yeah, you're right, I'm like, but yet you come back from this meeting, this big power meeting where you're going to fix these problems, and you're telling me that out of 1,500 people, you only remember two people from the private sector. Do you now see the problem we have? Technocrats? And they're like, woo! <laughs> right? Now, at that point, I all have them in the bag. You know, they're now starting to be like, their minds are like, I'm seeing some eyes over there. Some of them, I can almost feel like, they feel like they've been lied to their entire life, but it's a whole other problem. Um, <laughs> at that point, I'm like, okay, 
If entrepreneurs, if business is the solution, yes, let's try and make sure we look at the business climate. Then, that's when comes my best and favorite ranking in the world, the Doing Business Index ranking of the World Bank. Who has looked at it here? The Doing Business Index ranking of, a, of uh, the World Bank. I don't see a lot of hands up, I see a few hands up. For the rest of you, make sure you pay attention to that because it will be one of your best allies to make your point out there. So, Doing Business Index. It's the index that measures how hard or easy it is to start a business and run a business in any country around the world. And guess what? We find that most of the poor people are at the bottom of the list. Yes, of course. Because the harder you make it for entrepreneurs to do their work, uh, of course, the less businesses will be created. And the less businesses are created, the less jobs you get. It's that simple. And then you're going to come and complain that, oh, yeah, but business is so bad because in those countries, we only get the multinationals. Yes, you only get the multinationals because you made it so hard for the little people to get in the game, but only the big guys are left, and then they get to screw everybody else. Yes. So you see why I don't have a lot of patience for the technocrats. And then finally, we have those like you in this room who are absolutely willing to stand up for capitalism and defend it any time, any day. And I say, thank you. But, is but, I need you guys to be more powerful out there because right now, you are being crushed by the side that claims to care about me. They right now hold the moral high ground, and they use it to crush you down. But the more they crush you, the more they slow you down, the more they slow these ideas down, and it means more of my people are condemned to a life of poverty and indecency in terms of ways of living. So yes, this matters to me, so it is my goal to try and make you as powerful as you can as you are advocates of these ideas. <laughs> uh, one thing I ask you, one thing I ask you, if you want to be more powerful at that, you need to stop doing it from, the, uh, from an ideological perspective. That doesn't work. It doesn't. So, why do I care so much about poverty? And we're going to go into some of the solutions. But first, I want to walk you through the reality of poverty. Because I want you to feel it in your guts as much as I feel it in my guts. Because then you get to talk from your guts. And when you talk from your guts, people listen to you. There is no other choice. So, what does poverty mean for me, Magat Wade, from Senegal? Poverty in my case, the poverty of my people means that we have countless, countless young people, some of my most entrepreneurial people who are right now serving as fish food at the bottom of the ocean. Just two weeks ago, we had a boat tip over somewhere in the Mediterranean, and you hear about these stories, you see these pictures. I grew up with those stories of people dying at sea. Why? Because they had to leave their country because there is not enough jobs. And why there is not enough jobs? Because the business climate sucks so much that people like me can't do their work of creating companies and jobs. So they pack themselves into little fishermen's boat, try to cross to make it to Europe to find a job so they can feed their families back home. Most of them don't make it. Just two weeks ago, in a, again, another boat. Babies in it. Babies. And then we hear stories in Lib where People like me are being sold for $500 in slavery because they cross through there to try to make it to Europe and they get stuck over there. You want to talk about poverty? You want to know why it's so visceral to me? What type of a human being would it would be to leave knowing this and not give a damn? 
So first of the realities of poverty, and a lot of people, people from Ecuador, people from El Salvador, could tell you the same stories, probably. Different type of horrors, but still horrors. So, what are some of the solutions? Some of the solutions are, we pay attention to this doing business index, and we pay attention to the fact that the reason why these countries are poor, it's due to the fact that they are overwhelmingly over-regulated. This is something that everyone needs to know. Okay, let me give you some examples. You know, I just came back from Senegal three weeks ago. I now spend half my time in Senegal, and half my time here in the United States, uh, because my business, we produce our products back home, and we retail, it, we retail them here in the, in the United States. So, <laughs> We just finished um, setting up the manufacturing facility. We make skincare products. Let me give you an example as to the type of idiocy that I'm dealing with on a daily basis there. <laughs> so, you know, to make these beautiful creams for you, these beautiful lip balms for you, I need the best ingredients that the world has because I happen to be a very picky person and a very proud person, if I want to show you that us Africans are as worthy as anybody else, I also need to raise my bar, right? So nothing but the best for you guys and for myself. Because of that, I need to source my products from anywhere I see them in the world where they happen to be the best. So it turns out that right now in Senegal, out of all the ingredients and packaging that goes into my, let's say the Le Bon, that we're launching in September, only two ingredients for now I can get from my country because they match the standards that I'm looking for. All organic, the way it's done. I know some of you guys here don't believe in organic, but we're in a free world. I believe in organic, leave me alone. Okay, so fine. <laughs> um, so, all the things that I need to know, it's traceable, uh, because you know, at the end of the day, if you guys today tell me, oh, because of your lip balm, I had uh, big rashes on my lips, or they became so big, it's your fault. Well, we, I need to have all my ducks in a row, everything, you know, we have test controls of everything at our lab, at a different lab, and everything is, you know, neat. We can trace it back, insurance can get on, everything. We, I can make my case, it's not because of us, but you got this big thing. In any case, um, so we have to have all of that, and you understand that my supply chain has to follow that type of rigor, right? So only two things in the product that I make can found, be found in the country. Everything else has to come from somewhere else. And you know how that goes. We're, it's a global world, you know? We, we source from wherever we can and where we find what suits us. Well, did you know that unless I jump through hoops and, ho through hoops and hoops and hoops, any Thing that I import in my country to make my product gets a tariff of, do you know how much? 45%. Then how, 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 how can I be competitive with that? So if I can't be competitive with that, do you even think that business is viable? No, it's not. So my country's like, yeah, okay, yeah, that's right. That kind of sucks. So, okay. Uh, you jump through these hoops, fill out all of this paperwork, do this, do this, do that, and then we will come and do all of these controls at your site and everything, and then we'll give you an exoneration for three years. And if you're being a good citizen, then maybe we'll extend it for another two years. That's what we have to do right now. Do you see the disadvantage that I have compared to a woman who is here in America and starting her business herself? One nonsense. Another nonsense. Do you know that right now I'm trying not to hire anybody with a degree? You're like, why? Yeah, why? Because depending on the degree that you have, the level of a degree that you have, the state of Senegal forces me, the state of Senegal has decided what's the minimum wage that I can pay you. And it differs based on your degree. So if you have a PhD in philosophy, and I love philosophy, but you have a PhD in philosophy and you get to go find a job nowhere because no one really can use your skills in the business world, the way you have it presented, you're stuck, you have no job, but my graduate shows up and she's like, you know what? 
You have skills that I care about, it has nothing to do with your degree in, in philosophy, it has nothing to do with your PhD in philosophy, but at least I have a job for you. And these are gonna be my rates. Well, I can't hire that woman with her little PhD in philosophy that has had no job for the past five years since she came out of school. Why? Because the minute I touch her, I have to pay her prices that are not justifiable for my business. See, on one end, they're asking us to go and get all of these degrees because they tell us a degree is gonna be your, um, your, your key to a job. But then people like me, when you come and you receive a reality, you can't hire them. How stupid is that? So right now, I'm trying to hire people with no degree or the lowest degree possible, so that's how I manage my flexibility. Of course I will go and treat my employees the very best because I also believe in that. I believe in the, mo in the stakeholder model rather than just the shareholder model. I'm a true, pure, conscious capitalist at heart and in mind. So imagine that nonsense. Oh, and by the way, huh, I am married to my employees. If I decide to hire you, give you just like a normal permanent job, you know like how you come and I sign a contract with you, we hire you, you're hired. The minute I do that, oh, for every year that I keep you, if for whatever reason we need to separate, A, I need to be able to justify the separation, and on top of that, for every year that I hired you, I owe you one month of severance. If you've been working for me for six years, everything has been going well, and we know business is ups and downs. All of a sudden, something happens. I need the flexibility to let somebody go. They're gonna, A, gonna ask me to justify, and by the way, they're, they're not gonna take into account so much that the economy is going down or whatever. It needs to be something else. And even if I do let you go then, I gotta pay the penalty. So let's say you've worked for me for six years now, I need to let you go. By the time I need to let you go, if it's for economic reasons, it means I'm probably struggling money-wise, right? But no, I have to have six months of severance for you. So most of the time, companies go down. Companies are doing that. But if you don't wanna go down, you wanna plan, plan ahead for that, what you do in my case is you say, I'm not gonna hire you permanent. So you are in an, in, you are in an un, it's just like forever that you have this two-year contract, two-year contract, two-year contract, or oh, it needs to be 23 months, not 24, because the minute it becomes 24 continuous months, the state automatically converts you into a permanent employee and then everything else kicks in. What does that do? And then for the employee, they did that to protect them. But what do they have now? All of these people walk around with no real permanent job. And they can't go to the bank and you know, get a loan or have an apartment you know, for the, uh, renting an apartment. You start to see all the nonsense that's going on. It's, it's madness, it's madness. If I sat here and told you about all the crazy stories, you would be like, why in the world are you doing business over there? Because someone has to. I am not someone who gives up. We have done a lot of work. You know, I created a mini um, diplomatic incident a few years ago, because as you can see by now, I have a big mouth, and I'm not <laughs> afraid to use it. So I was at this conference in Gabon, and we had all of these heads of, heads of states, uh, mostly from Africa, and my president was sitting right there with his wife next to him, and he expected probably me to be like the traditional good African, you know, be like, oh, everything is great, my, oh, president, you're such a great uh, president, blah, 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 keep going. And I was like, well, let me tell you about how things are going for my business, how it took me two years to set up my business over here in Senegal, and it took 15 minutes in the United States. How ridiculous is that? And I talked to them exactly about what I'm telling you guys right now. He was pissed off. Pissed. He was pissed. He was pissed. The organizers were freaked out. Everybody thought this was gonna be bad. And yes, there was a mini um, diplomatic incident. I heard about it, I had an earful about it. And then as if it was not enough, I decided to write for Forbes a column. It was supposed to be called, if I can't fire you, I can't hire you. They thought it was too harsh. They changed the title to something like whatever, but my point was still made. Because I didn't have it true, I see a couple here. You guys love each other, right? It seems like, right? Now, if I tell you that you marry him, and God forbid you want to divorce his ass for any reason, <laughs> you can't, would you marry him? Thank you. She's trying to be too nice because she should really say no. She said, I don't know about that one. Well, I know what you mean. You're probably not going to marry the guy. Just to be honest. So, if I can't fire you, I can't hire you. It's that simple. 
So that was after the mini diplomatic incident. I piled on with that article, and you know what they did? They started debating the article on national TV, the most respected TV show on national TV, debating my articles, two teams of experts, including the tax people, everyone was talking, and you know what, since then, my president made it a key that we, as a country, have to start paying attention to the Doing Business Index ranking, and he puts a lot of pressure on everybody for us to be better reformers. So, so what can you do, you guys over here? Because I know you people who care. Be aware. Everything I talked about today, go back, dig deeper, seek more. Watch Poverty Inc. if you haven't. It will give you a lot more information. So number one, be in the know. Number two, buy anytime you can. Do business with African entrepreneurs. Things are tough back home, trust me, but I am not giving up. Things are gonna get better. We are working, and a generation away from mine, and I'm hoping actually even 10 years away from by the time I'm done with this, that we're not talking about any of this nonsense anymore. But in the meantime, you guys, keep doing business with any African entrepreneurs that you can do business with. That's the best way to keep things going forward. Um, three, get into hacking and hacks to governments. Yeah, I said it. I don't care. I know that they watch what I say when I'm in these shores. That's fine. They don't own me. So, <laughs> hacks to government. We're talking, we're talking Bitcoin, we're talking blockchain, we're talking e-government, that's what we're talking. A few years ago, I met two guys, two tech founders, they were involved in the blockchain technology. I met them um, in Guatemala, and then we, were, we saw each other again. They're two um, tech people from New York, young people. And so, they were telling me how excited they were about, you know, they were gonna create this, uh, Bitcoin, ADM, um, this Bitcoin ATM and the debit card that goes with it. I said, well, it's all great, but it eh, doesn't impress me. But what would impress me is if you came to Africa with this technology and that we applied it to some real life issues down there. If you want to talk, call me. I thought they would be like, oh, whatever, lady. But they called me. And now they are in Senegal. Um, and then from Senegal, they went into Ghana. And uh, that's what they're doing. The business is there, doing well really, you know, um, fixing real problems for people on the ground. Those are the type of things you can do, right? Using um, the power of uh, technology and seeing how you can hack government as much as possible. Four, there is this phenomenon in town called the free cities. For those of uh, you who have not heard about this, I'm telling you this is the bomb. As far as I'm concerned, some people are like, oh, let's go to Mars. Go to Mars all you want. I'm very attached to planet Earth, thank you very much. I'm staying here, you, all, you guys all go if you want. But me, I'm gonna stay here and try to make this place right. Um, so yeah, I kind of gave up on a lot of states. But now, what could happen if, in a designated country, you get to you take a plot of land as inhabited as possible, and on that plot of land, you consider that plot of land like your computer, but the law that you get, that get to rule that plot of land, you consider it as your operating software. Now start to play with these ideas a little bit. Well, that's what Singapore has done, that's what Hong Kong has done, that's what allowed China to actually raise, take 700 million people out of poverty within 30 years, they basically tried to zone, their, tried to, uh, zone these places using capitalism for prosperity. So this is something big that's coming that I absolutely believe in. My husband, who is in the room here, can talk to you guys more about all of that. So in closing, I have marching orders for you. Actually, I have only one marching order for you. I know we're talking about freedom and everything, but uh, yeah, I dare to commend you. What is it? I want that any time any one of you runs into people who claim that capitalism is a problem, look them straight in the eyes. And in my name, I allow you that, in my name, tell them, how dare you condemn a billion people on this earth 
to poverty. How dare you condemn a billion people on this earth, most of them women and children, to living horrific lives and oftentimes horrific, meeting horrific deaths? Who the heck are you? What type of a monster are you? Turn the tide around. You want to talk about righteousness? Those people want to talk to me about righteousness? I'll give them righteousness. So whenever you see those people, stop arguing about minimum wage. Stop arguing about, you know, your right for, um, you know, like housing to, to be deregulated, maybe in San Francisco and all of that. I'm with you on that, trust me. But it's too complicated for some of you. You need to grab it where it is. There are low-hanging fruit. Stick to what's happening with the global poor. If you stick to that, I have noticed that none of these people dares to stand up to you. They just can't. And there is, the truth has a way. At this point, I truly, truly believe that this is pure truth. When we go and we talk to Peter Singer over at Princeton, he does not counter the ideas. He doesn't. He will say, oh, I never thought about it. But he doesn't counter it. This, my friends, is a moral high ground. Use it to make inroads in people's minds and hearts. And from there, go on to other issues that are maybe more complicated to deal with. But use it to build a common ground. And let no one ever tell you that you are these cold, part-blooded people that don't give a rat's ass about anyone but themselves. Because that's right now how they dare to talk about people like us who care about capitalism. And I do not care if there's a little D in front of your name, a little R in front of your name, or a little L in front of your name, or something else. I do not care. And I won't stand here saying that I vouch for all of your ideas. But when it comes to this idea of yours around free markets and around free capitalism, I am your biggest supporter, advocate, supporter, probably your, me your best messenger, and I am here to defend you as well. So all I'm asking is for you to have a little bit more courage and also just dare. Stop being ashamed of what it is that you believe in. If there is anything that I want to leave you with today, it's, it's that belief in your hearts and in your guts. But you've got it. You've got the right message. But I need so many more of you to be courageous about it and not let anything else digress you. Because any second you miss on speaking up probably means the life or the death of someone thousands of miles away from you. These ideas need to be let free, and they need to go. And everybody in this room is it. So thank you for who you are, and thank you for having come to this place. I used to be an anti-capitalist, by the way, so it's possible. Thank you, guys.